Good evening, and thank you for coming. We are especially grateful to you for braving the throng which has gathered for a competing event several hundred feet away, and we hope you didn't have too much trouble getting in here. I'm Jerry Shakeshaft in political science, representing here this evening the Committee on Pre-Legal Education. Over the years, it has been the privilege of the Committee on Pre-Legal Education of the University, in company with the University Lectures Committee, which receives generous financing from the government of the student body, to bring to the campus once a year, on or about the time of the general celebration of Law Day nationally, an authority on some facet of law, public policy, or jurisprudence from the bench, the bar, or the academic community. We have been privileged to have had some remarkable national figures, and tonight is no exception. This year, there are two welcome additions to the sponsorship. The Story County Bar Association, of which Professor Larry Curtis is the past president, and Mr. Clark Paisley, the current president, and the Iowa State Research Foundation, of which our colleague Professor Dan Griffin is the director. Both groups have been extremely generous with their help, and the addition is most welcome and gratefully received. I have told our guest, and he's somewhat charmed with the idea, that he is in one of the only three counties in the United States named for a justice of the Supreme Court other than John Marshall. And the Story County Bar has been most generous in its assistance this evening. Our guest this evening is the first speaker we have had in this series from the press, and he is one of America's, the American press's most distinguished and most productive members. In thinking about an appropriate introduction for Mr. Lewis, I was struck with how difficult it is, in a sense, to characterize him. In the Broadway show version of a Thurber carnival in the 50s, in the dance scene, in which a number of the late James Thurber's one-liners are spun off, the actress Alice Ghostly, and that was her name, turns to the audience and says, Walter Lippmann scared me this morning. I wish he could be more cheerful about the world. The quotation comes to mind not because of its revelation in Thurber's character of a failure to appreciate the purpose of a free and independent press, nor because Mr. Lewis would be either flattered or insulted by the comparison to Lippmann, but simply because, in the first place, he has long been a household word in these parts by virtue of his twice-weekly syndication in both of the most readily accessible newspapers, producing in one household I know fairly well the remark that Anthony Lewis scared me this morning and because he bears a breadth of interest every bit the equivalent of Lippmann or more so. If he has to have a brief handle, then let's put it at the law in general. But especially in human rights across the world, at the constitutional rights and responsibilities of the press, a considerable degree of expertise on the British political and juridical system, and as a recognized expert in American constitutional history, particularly the history of the United States Supreme Court. But his columns and concerns run from first-hand accounts of apartheid to the Middle East, to the law lords, to the inner workings of the mind and philosophy of Governor Jerry Brown, and he has commented on them all with authority. Mr. Lewis is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. He won his first Pulitzer in 1955 for a series of articles in the Washington Daily News on the dismissal of a Navy employee as a security risk. The articles led to the reinstatement of the employee in some terribly tough times remembered by some of us of an age to remember them, and later became the basis for the movie Three Brave Men. He joined the staff of the Times in, in uh, uh, the Washington staff of the New York Times 
1955, after a period of previous service with the Times, and made the Supreme Court his special beat. He won his second Pulitzer in 1963 for his coverage of the court. And from 1965 to 1972 was chief of the Times London Bureau. He graduated from Harvard College, after which he went to the Times, switched to the Daily News, which I have mentioned, and covered general assignments in Washington for three years returning to the Times in 1955. He was a 1956-57 Neiman Fellow at Harvard, where he specialized in the study of law. He has twice won the New York State Bar Association Press Award. And he wrote the book, A Portrait of a De Decade, about changes in American race relations. Because of this occasion and because it is an educational institution, one feature of his work must be underlined, especially for undergraduates. He is known here more than anything else, perhaps, for his authorship of that classic on the Supreme Court and one great step toward fundamental rights, Gideon's Trumpet, the story of Gideon against Cochran to become Gideon against Wainwright, the overturning of Betts versus Brady on rights to counsel in state non-capital uh, cases. The first four or five chapters of Gideon are perhaps the best layman's description ever written of how the United States Supreme Court works and w interwoven with a considerable history of that court. Mr. Lewis has been assured that as long as the thing is available, it will not die in Ames. <clears throat> he is currently teaching a course at the Harvard Law School as a lecturer on law and is considered an expert on the constitutional rights and duties of the press, which he is teaching there. He has been already this year also a Regents Lecturer at the University of California Law School in Berkeley. With no further fuss, it is a great privilege and pleasure to welcome to the state of Iowa tonight, Mr. Anthony Lewis. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, if, if any of you is at some point in your life uh, at some point in your life find yourself making a speech, I hope that you will be one half so fortunate as to have an introduction like that one. Uh, the mere guarantee of continued royalties for one's book would be, uh, <laughs> would be enough. And then on top of that, a mention of Alice Ghostly. Um, <laughs> I could match Alice Ghostly or Thurber on Lippmann with uh, uh, a phrase from Pal Joey. It's a, a song called Zip, which most of you are too young to remember. Uh, it has nothing much to do with the evening, but I can't resist saying it. Um, it's a parody, a takeoff of Gypsy Rose Lee, the intellectual strip teaser. And it's sung by a newspaper reporter, a woman newspaper reporter, who interviews Miss Lee. Miss Lee, I said, and what do you think about while you are performing your art? <clears throat> Walter Lippmann wasn't brilliant today. <laughs> That's how it begins. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Shakeshaft. It was uh, really a very touching and pleasant introduction for me. And I'm exceptionally pleased to be here, uh, though I have, having heard a bit about what uh, Professor Shakeshaft teaches from him and from a few of his students, I have the feeling that I may be treading uh, at least some extremely familiar ground, which I hope you will forgive me. If men were angels, those are the opening words of what I think is the most compelling brief explanation of the American Constitution. Passages by James Madison, and it comes from the Federalist Papers. 
Madison, with his colleagues, was trying to explain why this country needed a written constitution. And in a paragraph, this is what he said. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. I hope you will overlook my beginning with such a well-known quotation. I did so in part because I like it so much. It reminds us that in the 18th century, American politicians could write English. But the passage also begins to tell us why law and politics, my twin subjects this evening, are so extraordinarily linked with each other in this country. Auxiliary precautions were needed to prevent abuse of official power, Madison said. The Constitution took those precautions by, for example, granting only limited power to the new federal government. And then the Bill of Rights and other amendments named personal rights so sacred that they could not be abridged by government, freedom of speech, press, assembly, and so on. But those limits on the power of government might have meant nothing at all if we had not developed a way to enforce them. The way was law. The authority of courts to hold acts of Congress and the president and state legislatures and officials unconstitutional, unlawful. That mechanism, that judicial power to hold government in check, which we take for granted, but is really quite extraordinary as an idea in a democratic society, has undoubtedly been the great American contribution to political theory. And it necessarily results in mixing law into politics to a degree that even the best informed people abroad, in England, for example, where I lived for a long time, find hard to understand. There are dramatic examples of the mixture of law and politics with which you're familiar, the Pen Pentagon Papers case, say, or the case of Alan Backey. But I thought I might begin by mentioning a couple of humbler examples, less glorified and more typical. In the last term of the Supreme Court, a group of students spent a day with me in the court listening to arguments. We heard four cases, of which, for reasons of brevity, I think I'll mention just two. None of them was really, uh, was even remotely a great case. The subjects seem almost humdrum, yet they make a point. The first was about apples. The state of Washington accounts for about half the apples shipped in interstate commerce in this country. They go out in boxes marked with a grade, fancy, extra fancy, and so on. A few years ago, North Carolina passed a law saying that boxes of apples coming into that state could not be stamped with another state's grade. Now, Washington didn't like that because it thought that uh, it gained an advantage by advertising its Washington apples and their grades. And they sued. And they won in the lower court. It found that the North Carolina law burdened interstate commerce in violation of the Constitution. North Carolina officials took the case to the Supreme Court. Now, the other case that I'll mention of the four that we heard that day was about a curious Delaware law. You will notice that the cases I am discussing are not, though I could have mentioned some. One other that day was of that category, are not uh, what we characteristically think of civil rights or civil liberties cases in the Supreme Court. In any case, this uh, 
under the Delaware law, anyone who owns shares in a Delaware corporation and who is sued in a Delaware court over any issue, an issue that has nothing to do with the shares at all, an automobile accident in Utah or anything, has his shares immediately sequestered by the Secretary of State or some official of Delaware. Sequestered, seized. The object of that is to make him come in and defend the suit, agreeing to the jurisdiction of the Delaware courts. It applies to someone who has never been in the state and has no connection with it at all, except that he owns, say, a few shares of General Motors stock. The state Supreme Court found nothing wrong with that law. Some unwilling defendants who had been pulled into the Delaware courts by having their shares seized appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now it takes, I think, though those cases are rather dry, they would hardly, uh, I will say that neither of them uh, rose to the level, as I recall, of a story in the New York Times when they were decided. I don't think it takes any great imagination to understand that they had importance and that each in its way touched on fundamental aspects of the American system, the ties that hold this country together and the strains that separate us. The Apple case was not just about apples. It tested some of the principles that helped to create a great national market in the United States and gave us the most productive economy in the world's history. 150 years ago, Chief Justice John Marshall, for whom I think Professor Shakespeare told me, was it eight counties have been named in this country? A rare distinction. Said that no state may impose a local rule that discriminates or sets up barriers against interstate commerce. If the Supreme Court had not said that, I think we would have 50 economies in America today instead of one. Each state would have not only its apple labeling law, but its own border taxes and tariffs and so on. It was not a great surprise, therefore, when at the end of that term, the Supreme Court held the North Carolina apple law unconstitutional. The Delaware sequestration case, obscure as it sounded, was also potentially very significant. More than half the corporations in this country are chartered in Delaware because of its friendly corporation laws. Do we really want to bring those millions of shareholders within the grasp of the Delaware courts, although they have nothing else to do with Delaware? And if that ingenious device works, what retaliation will other states think up? Will Delaware citizens be dragged to Wyoming and so on in a new jurisdictional war between the states? the Supreme Court must have had some of those concerns in mind when it found the Delaware law unconstitutional. They were very different cases, but they had one characteristic in common, their intensely American nature. Uh, in Britain, no such case could have arisen because there is no federal system. There are no divided heads of authority, no court to decide which authority shall prevail. No court to say that the legislature has transgressed fundamental law. No fundamental law, no written constitution. If Parliament passed a law saying that judges must stand on their heads in court, wigs and all, uh, judges could do nothing about it. Uh, more seriously, judges, uh, it, more seriously, when Parliament treats a group of British passport holders unequally because of their race or deprives a company of its property without just compensation, and those are actual cases that happened while I was in England, the courts can do nothing about it. Strange as it would seem in most other countries, the idea of judges overruling government decisions is altogether familiar to Americans. It is woven into our expectations. Any one of us could imagine going to court to fight some legislation or official action that we found oppressive. It is part of the process. Or so I would have thought. But lately, and more and more loudly, uh, the courts have come under harsh criticism. 
Some voices are saying that our judges exercise too much power. George Wallace put it a few years ago, uh, only a few years ago, with character characteristic pungency. Thugs and judges, he said, have just about taken charge of this country. A Harvard sociologist, Nathan Glazer, spoke of an imperial judiciary. A year ago, Newsweek magazine summed up the criticism in a cover story with the questioning title, Too Much Law, and just a week or two ago, Time magazine, not to be outdone, uh, did a cover story on the booming legal profession that said, in effect, too many lawyers. I gather that there are 400 pre-law students in Ames. <coughs> Now, judges have been deciding great questions in the United States for a very long time, and they have been criticized from the beginning. And so one must wonder why the fresh and strident swell of denunciation. What exactly is the complaint? One critic, Senator William Roth of Delaware, put it as follows. The judiciary is an anti-majoritarian institution. Since it is not accountable to the people, it should not attempt to work the people's will. The proper role of the judiciary is to uphold that will as expressed in the Constitution and the laws enacted by the legislature. Anti-majoritarian, the senator says, but that is the whole point of the Constitution. There are some things that majorities are not allowed to do in this country. Deprive minorities of the right to speak freely, for example or make minorities wear yellow stars on their clothes. Does Senator Roth want the Constitution to become a polite set of notices with nobody enforcing them? Does he think the court should uphold racial discrimination when some official body engages in it, or allow misguided policemen to torture prisoners? The same doubts are aroused by his statement that the court should uphold the people's will as expressed in the Constitution. Unfortunately for that theory, uh, the words of the Constitution are not self-explanatory. When it guarantees everyone the equal protection of the laws, does that mean that Alabama can force Rosa Parks to ride in the back of the bus, as was thought for two, three generations? The phrases of the Constitution are often as vague as those that the priestess of Delphi used to mutter after inhaling the fumes at the oracle. Someone has to apply them to particular cases. That someone in our system is judges, unless we want to give up enforcing the Constitution altogether. I cannot believe that Senator Roth really wants to do that. I think he was just engaging in a little politics at the expense of a rather defenseless target. The more frequent criticism of judges these days is that they weigh social and political values when they decide lawsuits. A candid answer to that charge is that it is true, but it has been true since 1789. There is no way to interpret the great generalities of the Constitution and apply them as law except by reading into them in any period of history what then seem to be fundamental truths. Consider the question of state barriers against interstate commerce, the apple question. Today we take for granted that the United States has one national market and that the courts will remove attempted state barriers. But all the Constitution actually says on the subject is one brief sentence. Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. That was a grant of power to Congress. It did not say anything about the courts protecting interstate commerce. Yet from that spare sentence, Chief Justice Marshall spun the principle that courts may set aside state taxes or regulations that obstruct commerce. It was a bold judicial act a flight of imagination, one could almost say. And to be honest, it did rest on some policy premises. When the justices decided that the right to operate in interstate commerce, as it happened in that case to operate a steamship, was something fundamental 
protected by the Constitution, they did so because they believed that national commerce was a good thing. They read the Constitution in light of that widespread, but by no means, universal belief. Was it wrong for them to do so? Should the court have shrugged and said it was up to Congress to remove any state obstructions to a free national market? If it had, I think we know what the result would have been. Congress could not possibly deal with every state that comes up with some clever scheme to protect local apples or whatever. It is too busy and it is too susceptible to regional pressures and log rolling. So the Supreme Court did what in fact was unavoidable if this was to be a nation. American judges have been doing that sort of thing from John Marshall right up through Earl Warren and Warren E. Berger. As time has changed our national perceptions of what is fundamental to liberty and justice, so have the judges' decisions changed. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. Do government agents violate that amendment when they eavesdrop on citizens by electronic means without getting a warrant first? In 1928, a majority of the Supreme Court said no, there was no violation. But after the rise of the totalitarian state, judges' perceptions changed. The right to freedom from official surveillance, from Big Brother, if you will, seemed more fundamental. Similarly with the freedom of speech and press, guaranteed by the First Amendment. It is clearer to us now than it used to be that our health, our freedom, the whole society's health, may be affected if radicals are suppressed, sent to jail for their views, denied the right to travel. Or race. In 1896, the Supreme Court said there was nothing unequal about making black children go to separate schools, nothing invidious in it, unless the segregated minority chose, in the words of the court's opinion, to put that construction upon it. After Adolf Hitler, the world knew, and the Supreme Court would have been blind not to see, that it was invidious to separate out a racial minority and make those people go to separate schools or sit in the back of the bus. Of course, the judges may be wrong in their perception of what is fundamental to the American spirit or unpersuasive in their explanation of the constitutional text. Chief Justice Tawney thought he could settle the conflict between North and South in the middle of the last century by deciding that blacks could not be citizens of the United States. His decision helped to bring on a war that overruled his faulty view of the Constitution. In this century, a majority of the Supreme Court decided that Congress could not constitutionally act against child labor. History has washed those decisions away as it has others that failed the ultimate test of the Supreme Court's power in this country, the test of persuasion, persuading us. This reminds me of a man who was the single most influential member of the Supreme Court in my lifetime, Justice Hugo L. Black of Alabama. Justice Black was under no illusion that what the court did in his time was popular in large sections of the country and especially not in Alabama. But once musing, he told me he was sure that in the end the people of America would never reject the court's decisions on the First Amendment, the ones that meant the most to Justice Black. He was certain that his absolute belief in free speech reflected the true spirit of America even if people grew angry at this group or that and for a moment wanted to take away its rights. Listening to him, I will interject one felt for good or ill that uh, it was an oracular voice that Hugo Black was doing his best to speak with the voice, the historical voice of the Constitution almost as it had come through the ages speak with the voice of what he thought this country was about, even though from time to time the people might forget what it was about. 
Was Justice Black wrong? Would Americans generally, or even today's strident critics of the courts, really want to strip judges of their constitutional function? Would they want to let North Carolina erect barriers against foreign apples? Let Delaware drag shareholders from across the country? Let some local political boss shut down newspapers that displease him? I doubt it. I doubt that many Americans would really want to live without the protecting hand of the courts. And so when I read some of the shrill attacks on judges these days, I think there is less there than meets the eye. I suspect that the criticism is less high-minded philosophical disapproval of the judicial role than it is disagreement with particular decisions. No critics sound more high-minded, for example, than the group who could be fairly described as the neoconservative intellectuals, such as Professor Glazer, who condemned what he called the imperial judiciary. This group says that judges should not interfere so much with the decisions of political authorities in a democracy. Well, let us think about their position in the Bakke case, of which I'm sure you know. The University of California Regents, a political body, adopted a special admissions program for minority students. Mr. Bakke asked the courts to upset that program as unconstitutional. Now, logically, Professor Glazer and other neoconservatives should, I suppose, be urging the courts to keep their hands off a policy that a state body freely adopted by a political method and let that affirmative action program alone. But of course, they are doing the opposite. They want the courts to step in this time because they do not like this particular political program. It would be unfair to expect consistency from the critics any more than from the rest of us. I In the more recent period of decisions expanding individual rights, <coughs> conservatives made the running. The two sides have even used the same language at different times, tyranny and so on while really focusing on the results judges reach in particular cases. But there is a new element in the argument today, and it is fair for me to state it. In a number of cases, federal judges have issued far-reaching affirmative orders to state or federal officials, requiring them, among other things, to spend public funds in significant amounts on new programs. The best known examples are probably the decisions of United States District Judge Frank M. Johnson of Alabama ordering that state to improve conditions in its prisons and mental institutions. Those cases are indeed novel in the remedy found necessary to repair the constitutional fault. The traditional remedy in constitutional litigation was simply to tell an official to stop doing something, stop keeping stop keeping that child out of a school, or stop holding a prisoner unlawfully when a writ of habeas corpus is at issue. Affirmative orders, looking not so much to relieve past wrongs as to assure reform in future, seem more legislative in character. Moreover, they may involve judges very deeply in administrative detail. The hospital and prison and also school busing decisions, <coughs> as in Boston, have been condemned in the harshest terms as abuses of the judicial function. In Commentary Magazine recently, a lawyer named Elliot Abrams wrote, and he was writing about school busing and Judge Johnson's uh, prison and mental hospital cases, quote, the clearest explanation for recent court rulings may be that they expand the power of the courts a result presumably not objectionable to most judges. Thus a judge creates himself a kind of sociologist king. George Wallace could hardly outdo the unpleasantness of such a charge against judges. The critic condemns them on the basis of their asserted motive, a love of power, without reference to the facts of the cases that they had to decide. I think it might be useful to mention 
a few of those facts. In a lawsuit challenging the treatment of sick inmates in Alabama prisons, there was evidence that a quadriplegic confined in a prison hospital had bed sores infested with maggots. His bandages were changed once in the month before his death. There was much other evidence too revolting for me to repeat. In the suit on Alabama mental institutions, it was shown that one inmate was kept in a straitjacket for nine years <clears throat> to keep him from sucking his fingers. Others were scalded to death or killed in other gruesome ways. In a suit challenging conditions in Alabama prisons as cruel and unusual punishment, counsel for Governor Wallace conceded at the close of the trial that, quote, the overwhelming majority of the evidence shows that an Eighth Amendment violation has and is now occurring in the Alabama prison system, close quote. It was only in the face of such evidence and such admissions that Judge Johnson found violations of inmates' rights. And even then, he was reluctant to impose a remedy. In the mental institutions case, he twice asked state officials to propose a plan for relief of the cruelty and misery. Only when the deadlines passed without action did the judge, in consultation with all parties, define minimum standards in an order that is the subject of the criticism. I think it would be nice if the intellectuals who speak so knowingly of judicial motives, who dismiss judges contemptuously as sociologist kings, had even briefly to face the human realities that confront a judge. Would the conservative critic be able to remain indifferent as he heard about two men living 21 hours a day in a roach-infested cell the size of a small bathroom with cots jammed up against the one filthy toilet? Perhaps he would, but if so, I hope he will keep to the pages of commentary and not become a judge. The example just given of the jammed and filthy cell refers not to Alabama, but to the Charles Street Jail in Boston, where I live, which Judge Arthur Garrity ordered closed. Even in a state as supposedly enlightened as Massachusetts, it has taken lawsuits to do something about dreadful conditions in jails and in homes for the retarded. Just as in Alabama, one of the main effects of the suits has simply been to bring the facts to public notice, to touch the public conscience. The point is that there is often no other way. Prisoners and mental hospital inmates and their relatives do not usually have significant political power. Another point to make about these large-scale new suits to remedy defective state institutions is that state officials are often just as glad to have a judge act. They may know that a prison is inhuman, that the legislature is not responsive to the misery of people without power. So the officials make a political speech denouncing judicial interference while privately welcoming the court order. And none of this proves that sweeping reformist orders by courts necessarily work well. They should be scrutinized and criticized and examined. I only say that we should remember the facts that called them into being. Those who talk about limiting the judicial function should also indicate what alternative processes they have in mind. If judges stayed out of the, stayed out of the controversial problem of prison conditions, for example, would there be any other way, realistic way, of correcting the most primitive brutality? For example, 18 months ago, the Justice Department brought suit in the federal courts against the state of Illinois and Chicago corrections officials, charging that prisoners there were held under unsafe, insanitary, and racially discriminatory conditions. That was done by a most thoughtful careful and conservative Attorney General, Edward Levy, a scholar highly sensitive 
to the risk of judicial overreaching. Moreover, he happens to come from Chicago, and he knows all about the possibilities of change through political mechanisms there. Edward Levy must have been convinced, I think, that conditions in the Illinois prisons and the city jail were utterly inhuman, or he would never have authorized such a lawsuit. Now, what might he have done instead of taking the issue to the courts? A practical question. He could have written, I suppose, written a letter to the local authorities. But they surely knew the Justice Department's views already and had done nothing. He could have made a public speech, but that would probably not have been either popular with Illinois politicians or effective. Or if time allowed, I suppose he could have proposed a new administrative mechanism in the federal government, a prison inspectorate with power to examine local jails all over the country and require improvements to bring them up to minimum standards. But assuming that Congress would create such a body, would it be wise to set up a national bureaucratic enforcement mechanism? Would the states welcome it? Would it be less intrusive and less costly than an occasional lawsuit? I think the courts are as good an answer as we have in this country. I speak only about this country, to many problems. They are a useful instrument of our federalism, our system of scattered power in a cont continental-sized country. Because they are ad hoc in their process, they respond to particular problems as they arise, without building up a permanent bureaucracy or attempting to manage things all the time. Moreover, and this is often forgotten, Federal courts are both national and local in character. A federal judge feels himself or herself a direct representative of national standards, of the Constitution and federal law. But he lives in a local community, and he is often a product, usually a product, of its education and its bar and its politics. And the federal court in Wyoming or Arkansas or Iowa may be much more accessible to a local citizen than a bureau in Washington. I think courts are the most accessible institutions in our government structure today, and often the most responsive. They have to respond. That is their duty. The forum they provide for the airing of grievances is also the most direct, immediate, and personal that the ordinary aggrieved citizen is likely to find. That is true even in the Supreme Court. Because today, with two or three or four times as many cases to winnow through as was true when I wrote the Gideon book, the Supreme Court remains a very intimate, rather small institution. Anyone who a year ago heard those justices questioning counsel to get the facts about apples would understand how personal and intimate a process it is, one not conducted through staffs and intermediaries. The courts can also balance out the advantages of wealth and power in our system. When New York State, a few years ago, imposed what it called a moratorium on the payment of New York City notes, a little bank in Queens sued on behalf of the individual note holders. The bank was represented by a firm of just four lawyers. It was up against one of the best-known lawyers in the country, Simon Rifkin, backed by a firm of 150. But the bank won, this little bank, against the big banks and the big law firm. And afterward, its lawyer, Arthur Richenthal, said to me, it shows what the courts can do for the small guy. The right of the individual to sue for protection of his privacy or his job or his clean air is an answer to concentrated forms of power in the com community. It is the ordinary citizen's answer to the lobbying power of big business or big labor or the big bureaucracy. That may be why Congress has deliberately chosen to leave the enforcement of many standards it sets, such as clean air, to private lawsuits. In light of those realities, it seems to me silly <coughs> to call American courts imperial or tyrannical. And I doubt that most people think they are. The public thinks better of the courts than of most of our institutions, I hope and believe. 
Even when judges have gone badly wrong in their perceptions of the country, as in the 1930s, the public has not wanted to change their extraordinary role in our system. It has understood that judges bring qualities of reflection and principle to decisions of great social questions that would otherwise be missing. Of course, it is true that excessive reliance on judges would weaken public responsibility and get us out of the habit of solving problems by political compromise. And it is true that judges make mistakes, often serious ones. But the most important judicial decisions in my lifetime, I think, met the tests, the test of understanding the American spirit. And far from being anti-democratic, they nourished democracy. I have in mind two decisions that you undoubtedly hear about Professor Shakespeare's course, two that meant the most to me in the period I was closely following the court, the reapportionment cases holding that the districts for election of state legislature, legislators and members of the National House must be roughly equal in population and Brown against Board of Education, holding ra racial segregation in public schools and by implication in other public facilities unconstitutional. Now just think what the country would be like today. One way of thinking about the courts, think what the country would be like today if the Supreme Court had decided just those two cases the opposite way. Certainly the, the 50 states of the country, I think, would be living in a different kind of political climate because before the reapportionment cases, <coughs> the sparsely populated parts of almost every state had a grip on its legislature and would never have let it go unless the Supreme Court had resolved the dilemma in the voice of the Constitution. It was said when the court decided that case that it would be unenforceable, but it was not. The decision was easily accepted. It was seen to be right. There has been no difficulty enforcing it, and democracy has benefited across the country. And where would we be today if the Supreme Court in 1954 had held that racial segregation in this country was constitutional? I suppose about a third of the public schools in the United States would be segregated by law. Hospitals and theaters and public transportation and parks would be divided by a line of color. There would be few black voters in the South and probably no black elected officials. And Jimmy Carter would not be president. Why do I believe all that would have followed from a contrary decision in Brown and Board of Education? Because I lived through that decision and its aftermath. And I know what forces the Supreme Court released in this country, moral and political forces. The decision gave the black people of this country hope for justice. It gave them the courage to demand other basic rights, first the right to vote, and then the right to equal service at a lunch counter, and then others. It began to open the eyes of the white majority to the terrible nature of racial discrimination. The first Civil Rights Act ever to get past a Senate filibuster passed in 1957. That could never have happened if the Supreme Court had not pricked the conscience of the country on the issue of race. The 1957 Act began the registration of blacks as voters in the South. When that law was obstructed by crude tricks and violence, more laws were needed and now could not be stopped. The struggle for racial justice took on a political aspect, and change did come. You're too young, most of you, to remember how much change did come, but it was a lot. The human difficulties of race relations are often discouraging. Today, the problems look harder than we used to think. The moral answer is less clear. But we should not forget what has been accomplished. When I was your age, which was a very long time ago, but not forever. In Washington, D.C., uh, black people could not sit down and eat lunch at a drugstore lunch counter or go to a theater or serve in the United States Armed Forces except in segregated units in my lifetime, ladies and gentlemen. So I say we should not forget what has changed, largely because of the courts. There has been a revolution in a large region of our country a revolution of feeling, of politics, and of the real conditions of life for many people. I just don't know 
of any peaceful change anywhere in the world in our time that comes close to the record of the United States on the issue of race, thanks, I believe, to the Supreme Court. Criticism of the courts is a familiar feature of the American landscape, <clears throat> and I would be the last to want to remove it. But if the critics want to be taken for something more than political opportunists, if they want their views to rate intellectual respect, then they should be wary of using bombast. They might think what this country would be like if the despised and rejected in society could not look to the courts for support, indeed, if all of us could not defend our interests in the courts. There are legitimate reasons to worry about the role of judges, as we have become more and more frustrated about the ineptitude of other branches of the federal government, the petty fumbling of Congress, self-protective self obstruction of the executive bureaucracy, we have placed our hopes more and more on judges. And there is a danger of carrying that too far. For one thing, courts can be, be bureaucratized, too, if they are overburdened. A thoughtful critic, Donald Horowitz, warned in a recent book that the courts, in developing a capacity to improve on the work of other institutions, may become altogether too much like them. But in recognizing that danger, we must not forget the great freedom and personal security that judicial enforcement of the Constitution has given us. To borrow from Shakespeare, I think our system is the envy of less happier lands. I've experienced feelings uh, of longing for American constitutionalism in other countries. Uh, the one where it was sharpest and is sharpest is South Africa, where there is no Constitution where law is the expression of state force, not the expression of protection of individuals. And beyond what others think, we should have our own understanding and pride. We have gone through some terrible things in this country lately, assassinations, a draining war, a criminal conspiracy at the top of our politics. But we came through intact, and we did so because of our constitutional institutions. We survived because we had a system of laws, not men. Even Richard Nixon felt obliged to bow in the end to law, to the Supreme Court, the branch of government that the authors of The Federalist said would be beyond comparison the weakest of the three, having neither force nor will, but merely judgment. In the tradition we have forged, Judgment is enough. Thank you. Thank you.